Good morning to those joining us in the United States. Good evening to those joining from South Asia and across Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Welcome to the Atlanta Council. I'm Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our discussion today on navigating Pakistan's national security challenges with Dr. Maureen Yusuf, the Assistant to the Prime Minister of Pakistan on National Security and Strategic Planning. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf, for being with us today. It's a real pleasure to welcome you, I think, for your first conversation since you've gone back to Islamabad uh, with a Washington-based audience. We're delighted to have you today. The Atlanta Council fosters U.S. engagement in the world alongside friends and partners to shape a better future. And our South Asia Center reflects this mission with its deep engagement and commitment to, part, to problem solving in the region. The center works to promote, develop sustainable nonpartisan strategies to address the most important challenges facing the region. And we're delighted to be able to engage with Dr. Yusuf on the range of critical issues facing Pakistan. Dr. Yusuf is the eighth national security advisor to the prime minister assuming that role last December. And of course, he is no stranger to Washington having previously served as the Associate Vice President at the Asia Center at the United States Institute of Peace, where our own Executive Vice Chair, Steve Hadley, is Chairman. Moeed, it's great to have you back in DC, albeit virtually for this timely discussion. We look forward to when we can see you in person. But conversations such as these represent an opportunity to build both public awareness and our own understanding of Pakistan's complex national security objectives and importantly, how our two countries can navigate these regional challenges. Moderating the Q&A portion of the conversation today is Dr. Sahar Khan, an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Thank you, Dr. Khan, for joining us today. She'll be leading the more interactive portion of the discussion by bringing some of our esteemed audience on camera to engage with Moeed. So before I turn it over to you, Dr. Yusuf, for your remarks, I wanna remind everyone that the event is live and it's on the record. And so we encourage all of you to join this conversation on Twitter at AC South Asia using the hashtag Pakistan National Security, all one word. And feel free to enter your comments and questions uh, in the Zoom Q&A function. Uh, we look forward to the conversation with Dr. Yusuf. Over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Damon. Uh, thank you to the Atlantic Council. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. It's, it's weird, <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be back, even if from 10,000 miles away. And I'm sure uh, a lot of old friends uh, are listening in. So hello to everyone who I can't see, but but I'm sure you're present there. So uh, what I thought, Damon, I'd do is very briefly uh, go through where I see Pakistan standing, where we are looking at the U.S. and how, um, and then perhaps have a conversation. I don't don't want to speak for too long. I think it's it's always better in these. Um, uh, think tank environments to have a conversation and quite frankly I haven't followed Washington nearly as closely as I used to so it'll be very good to get feedback and, and get, get a sense of what people are thinking that so to begin with let me just tell you because a lot of friends in DC have asked me what exactly my job is so I think that's a good starting point to explain that I've actually got two roles um, I sit in the office of the National Security Advisor of course as you've mentioned uh, and that role is pretty much understood um, as, as NSAs are. But I have another role, which is strategic policy planning, which essentially simply put is long term perspective thinking and planning uh, on issues related to national security defined as broadly as possible. Includes uh, non traditional security, health security, climate and security, etc. Uh, and so if I were to put it very simply, this role of mine puts me to be uh, the prime minister's think tank. Uh, and so that's really, I think, where the background comes in and why somebody like me was, was seen to be useful for this role. I said that the definition of security is as broad as it gets. So, you know, the very first thing <laughs> the, that I've had to deal with uh, in any substantive way uh, is health security because I landed up and three months later, four months later, we were in uh, the midst of the corona pandemic. Uh, and so if one were to ask, what are you looking at sitting in this role? What is the difference? Where does Pakistan go from here? Where are we? I'd say two things to you. First of all, I'll tell you that a lot of what I used to think and write sitting in Washington 
has had to be revised. Uh, because once I've come into the system, I've realized that things probably, or actually now I know, uh, do not work uh, exactly in the way that we, perhaps sitting in Washington, used to think uh, things worked in Pakistan. I mean, it's a very um, good learning experience for me, but, but also I want to shed a little bit of light on this as I go on. But the big thing I want to put on the table is that if there's one word that explains what I am trying to do and the system is trying to do and where we're trying to go, it is that the moniker that Pakistan wants to put to the world is a term called economic diplomacy. Virtually everything that we want to think about in terms of where Pakistan is, how we interact with the world, including the US, we want economic diplomacy to be the front and center of that conversation. And herein lies the first difference of what you know, a lot of us talked about in Washington when I was there and even now, our focus was on hard security. A lot of times all conversations about Pakistan revolved around security. And the very first thing I tell you is that my day and night is spent in talking about economic diplomacy as um, the, the conversation, the conversation that Pakistan wants to have and is trying to have. What does economic diplomacy mean? It means commerce. But at the same time, it means services. It means tying Pakistan's political uh, relationships with countries with the economic interest. It implies talking about the economy and finding space for investment uh, and finding space for Pakistan's economic footprint, far more than talking about the hard security that Washington, um, uh, we talked about in Washington when I was there, and I'm sure that that continues. Is this a paradigm shift? I would say yes and no. I think the paradigm had shifted some time back, but the arguments or, or the, the perspective or the vantage point in Washington may be catching up with a lag. Uh, and so I don't think this is a transformational change. I don't want to say that I sat here and changed anything. This was where, the, where things were moving and the direction was when I came in. And really, it's, it's basically reinforcing that that um, that direction. But I'll also be the first one to acknowledge that we are having problems in terms of actualizing this uh, in a way that the pace at which I at least want to move and the country wants to move, the Prime Minister of Pakistan wants to move, we may not have achieved um, at this point. Why? And here, let me put to you that fundamentally the problem that we're facing is one of the neighborhood. It's the neighborhood we're situated in and where things are, which really are not in our control for the most part, um, is where the problem lies. When I talk economic diplomacy, it's an outward facing function, but really what it requires is for people like me and my colleagues to be able to focus internally, to get our sort of economic um, weaknesses uh, resolved, to look at internal strength and then project that outwards through economic diplomacy. Unfortunately, from the very day that I joined, which was, uh, I think, October sometime, my sort of the bane of my existence, the 23 hour clock out of the 24 that I, I spent doing this, unfortunately, has been the situation on the Eastern Front. Uh, I probably know as much as all of you that it's a very difficult conversation to have in Washington. I don't want to put out the party line. This is not a Pakistani official, but let me put my think tank hat on and say one thing to you. It is humanly impossible for us to see peace in South Asia if India's current ideology and policy in the region continues. And it is equally impossible let me take the liberty to say, for the US to achieve its objectives in South Asia, if we don't see the internal and external direction that India is taking, at least from where I sit. In the past few weeks, we've seen a spat with China. Last year, we saw the issues with Pakistan in terms of Balakot and Pulwama. We've seen Nepal come up with a resolution and a map, and we've seen Bangladesh signal differently. 
if I were to be brutally honest, I think it'd be very unfair to think that the entire region has gone crazy and is raising concerns about one particular actor. Much more likely is that these countries are seeing a legitimate issue, concern, and fear from this country and reacting to that. And if you want to ask me, I think the fear is based on two things. One, we are seeing an expansionist mindset play out not only in rhetoric, but in action. We've heard India talk about Pakistani side of Kashmir, Azad Jammu Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan being India's. Uh, we've seen India talk about taking it by force. Add to that what we have seen in the um, territory itself, in the illegally occupied territory itself, where we are seeing a continuing um, sort of siege, curfew, uh, lockdown, whatever you want to call it. Uh, even amidst the pandemic, that was used as an excuse to continue what they were doing. Now, I don't want to talk to you about how bad this is and the human rights violations, all of that. You, you all know that. But I also know there's usually a negative rolling of the eyes kind of reaction in Washington to that. But what I really want to stress here <clears throat> is what I think is crucial for Washington. If you understand the character of Kashmir, and I just saw a couple of reports from USIP and I think a couple of other institutions have put something out, uh, the International Crisis Group and others. The one thing you cannot ignore is you're dealing with people who resisted for over a century. And you're dealing with people who will not give up. So if anybody thinks that India will basically just uh, power its way through a dictatorial kind of siege, get new parties in, get a new domicile law in, and the Kashmiris will just ultimately accept what is happening. What I can tell you with some confidence, we are within touching distance of a major implosion. What we see sitting here is that there is going to be a reaction, a resistance, whatever you want to call it. I know that fingers will be pointed by India and Pakistan, but I'm really telling you that where things are, it's a mat I mean, it's just human nature. And when that response comes, I also know the world would wake up to say, oh my God, there is a nuclear region and what's going to happen. What I am imploring you to consider is you can't let this go to that point. I'm not asking for any real estate. I'm not talking any territory. I'm not, this is not the party line. I'm just giving you a very honest view that I see an implosion forced by what is happening in uh, IIOJK. And you know that better than me. I don't need to get into that. I mean, as I said, the think tanks have written uh, very recently about this, uh, etc. Tied to that is the ideological agenda, which is putting minorities in a box at risk and perhaps more. Why is that important? That's important because Kashmir is becoming the acutest example or, of what is happening within it. And if you don't want to accept Pakistan's view, that's perfectly fine. Keep it aside. What you're seeing is the entire region now reacting to this mindset in India. And even if I were to accept the US sort of counterweight to China or market India, or whatever it is, an unstable country where this is happening internally to 300 million um, you know, Muslims and others, and what I'm seeing and saying about uh, Kashmir, no policy can sustain. So even from the US perspective, but again, that's for you to decide where I sit, I see this as a totally unsustainable suicidal path from India, which is going to end up in a complete disaster for all of us. You know, as the representative of the adversary, I should be saying if somebody is committing suicide as an enemy, good luck to you. I'm making the opposite argument. It's not good for South Asia to see conflict. It's not good for South Asia to see instability, but where that country is headed and where the policy and ideology is headed, there's only one option and that's an implosion. So let me just put this on the table. And when you see that happening, obviously I can't focus on economic diplomacy and internal issues. I first got to look at this external problem. Very quickly, 
Afghanistan. I let people ask me questions and say something about it. But if there is still any complaint left, I really want to hear it. Because in private conversations, and I'm grateful, US officials have been very forthcoming in acknowledging the Pakistani role, where we've gotten this situation with help from others. And now, quite frankly, the only way forward is for Afghans to take this, own this, and run with it to get to wherever they want to take their country. So the intra-Afghan process that begins in about a week's time um, is really an Afghan process. Pakistan and others will help as much as we can. But what we are really desperately hoping for is a constant process that gets to a solution of whatever the Afghans want with their country. And you will find Pakistan supporting that with only one caveat. Hardly any subversive activity in Pakistan, and I'm talking of violence and terrorism. Hardly any terrorist act in Pakistan right now is happening without fingerprints of external parties. So the red line here is that Afghan territory cannot be used against Pakistan. And I don't need to say more. Short of that, wherever Afghanistan is going, uh, it has everybody's blessings. And we want this process to be completed as soon as possible and for peace to return. But if there are any, still any lingering questions about Pakistan, I'm happy to answer. Third, and then I'll just make one other point, or rather two other points, sorry. Third is China, because I know somebody is going to raise this question, so let me just address it. Very clear policy on China. China is a strategic partner because one of Pakistan's key legs of economic diplomacy is connectivity. Unfortunately, the situation doesn't allow us to connect east-west, but north-south connectivity is as crucial for us. Westward connectivity is as crucial for us. Westward connectivity will come when Afghanistan finds some semblance of stability. North-south comes through China for us. So it's a strategic partner. It's absolutely crucial. What do we want? We want to make sure there's a clear understanding. We are not in the business of picking sides. We're in the business of telling the entire world that US and China are not at war. There isn't that confrontation that some are making it out to be. So from our perspective, the US is a critical strategic partner. We depend on the US a lot. The US depends on us a lot. We are simply not even entertaining any conversation that I've picked up from some, uh, even in Washington, oh, Pakistan is going to choose a camp and that's X or Y. There's no question of a camp because we ultimately want to see ourselves as the melting pot and specifically the economic melting pot for the region. We want transit, we want trade, we want big powers to come and invest. So US is welcome to invest. The UK is welcome to invest. Yes, China is a strategic partner. There's no need for me to shy away from that. But we want all of our key partners to play a role in stabilizing and strengthening Pakistan. So, you know, this idea that CPEC versus the US doesn't exist in Pakistan. This I can promise you in the government, in our minds, it doesn't exist. If there's still a question, I'm happy to answer. But really, we, are, we just don't see the world moving to a Cold War kind of camp situation. We're just not seeing that. And so we think that Pakistan is very aptly poised to play a role of a neutral actor in, um, in this region, uh, getting uh, support from our partners, even in the Muslim world, that's been our stated policy. So it's very much a direction where we want peace around us to be able to focus internally. Um, Final two points, COVID, Corona, because I, I know this was mentioned. Touch wood, uh, Alhamdulillah, we are at a place where we are seeing a massive drop in our disease spread. We were at about 22%. We're down to about 3%, 4%, 2.5%, depending on which area you look at. Our hospitals, we were worried in June, were going to be flooded and we're getting to that point. We've got empty hospitals now. Uh, our deaths are down to, I think uh, it was 15 maybe today. We've been down to as, as low as seven, but we're in the teens somewhere. Um, we have not ruled out a second wave. We are working on this. I was part of the uh, Corona response cell and literally we spend day and night and we continue to do that. We have just formally ended our lockdown as of today. So coincidentally today, we have formally ended our lockdown completely. 
only schools, uh, marriage halls, and a couple other places are closed. But basically, we are now very closely monitoring the opening to make sure we don't get into a second wave situation. But as of now, Pakistan is on a vertical downward trend. Thankfully, um, I can discuss why. I mean, there are complicated reasons. I don't think they're entirely relevant. Um, we will remain vigilant, but we do want the world to know that thankfully, we are almost through the first leg of this. Um, unfortunately, the region isn't. India is spiking. Bangladesh has a fair amount as well. Um, you know, and so things are going in the wrong direction there. But thankfully, uh, we feel due to multiple reasons, including our policy, we've managed to get to a point where the first wave is close to uh, over for us. Um, and finally, let me just... Uh, make one other point. Pakistan is looking to champion develop, developing country causes. You've seen the Pakistani Prime Minister stand up for debt relief. We've talked about the post-corona kind of relief and uh, support that we need. We've talked about this non-discriminatory uh, international travel regime after COVID, etc. But this positioning the developing country part, the neutrality part, uh, the no camps part is predicated, its success is predicated on us being allowed to follow our economic diplomacy course in earnest. And that won't happen unless the region stabilizes. And there, you can call it a Pakistani position, but quite frankly, I'm speaking as an analyst, if Pakistan's eastern neighbor continues the way it is and keeps the position that it has. This entire region will continue being unstable and more so. And I don't think um, even uh, outside interests can be met if that happens. Even Afghanistan will be undermined sooner or later <clears throat> if, if that continues. But the reason Pakistan is able to present this, this position, the reason I sit in this office and one of my roles essentially is, is to ensure that all of this comes together. Uh, frankly, is that Pakistan's never enjoyed a more uh, positive and seamless um, domestic governance slash civil military equation. I'm trying to address the issues that we used to raise in DC, and I, I know somebody may want to want to ask. Um, it's a formal uh, partnership, if you will where the civilian government is free to call upon uh, its uh, military wherever required. So in COVID, it was very much a formal civil military effort through the National Command and Operation Center. In other areas, um, you know, the civilians have essentially created a model whereby any conversation of a friction really is obsolete. And the best example of that, and I'll stop at this, and I think this one I'll get I hope I'll get support um, from, from uh, friends who are listening. The best example of what Pakistan is doing, and unfortunately the trajectory is chalk and cheese when it comes to Pakistan versus uh, our eastern neighbor right now. The best example is me sitting in this office. I can't give you a better example than this, and I'll tell you why. There is a logic and a reason, and even I didn't understand it when I uh, took up this position of why somebody with my background would be sitting in this office. I mean, my predecessor was a very decorated, celebrated, accomplished uh, three-star general. Before that, it was somebody who held the foreign minister and NSA portfolio. Why an analyst with no background because most of these positions in anywhere in the in the world are taken up by former officials one way or another for good reason the reason is the strategic policy planning part the reason is long-term perspective thinking the reason is pakistan moving in a direction that we want to and unfortunately are not moving as fast as we can because of of the regional issues but if you wanted one clear indication and example of strategic thinking, planning, uh, a civil military connect, and 
a forward looking view that we want the world to understand about pakistan because i am the first one to acknowledge that pakistan's image in the world still remains um 10 years or 7 years dated by about 7 8 10 years uh, sometimes when i hear people talk about pakistan or read things it's still 2011 2012 when i was guilty of this quite frankly uh, when uh, before i moved here so um, not to again put out any party line but uh, i wanted to sort of put this on the table that a lot of people ask me this question uh, this is quite quite frankly the, the honestly the best example i i would uh, be able to provide you on uh, where pakistan is right now i uh, said let me stop there and i am happy to be put in front of the firing squad well thank you so much for moi for your remarks and it's such a pleasure to see you it's been a long time so again congratulations on your new position um and you know i'm i'm really glad to hear from you i of course i've been following pakistan very closely as well and um some of the things you say it's nice to actually hear you say them because that's been my sentiment as well but um and, and we do have a series of questions here as well but as a moderator i get to ask the first question so i'm going to take advantage of that um you mentioned afghanistan and i know this is something even when you were at USIP of course this is something we spoke about a lot um and i think your answer was very good but there is one thing i would like to sort of push you on and which is that you mentioned that in private conversations us officials have been very thankful they've been really positive towards pakistan so why do you think it is that they won't convey that publicly especially to the us public um especially since you are doing strategic planning um and i can understand sort of pakistan's point of view a little bit about that but since you are sitting on the pakistan side now i'd love to hear from you uh, about why do you think they're so reluctant especially when you consider that this is an election year and withdrawing troops or at least somewhat ending the war in afghanistan was a, a campaign promise from president trump so if you could just answer that in a couple of minutes and then i'll i'll go to the other people so so i'm going to be brutally honest um one i think there has been one change that if there haven't been positive comments and i i would really love to to have them and quite frankly this question should be directed to somebody in washington not not me <laughs> but the negativity has gone down so if the positivity hasn't come even in public i don't see you know the the critique that used to come before and the reason is of course very clear as i told you um you know th there's clear acknowledgement in every private conversation that without pakistan afghanistan wouldn't have gotten to where where it is today that said the reason i said i'll be brutally honest is i think it also um i think the think tanks also bear some responsibility uh and you know sort of calling myself part of it it's not deliberate i mean i'm not making any any facetious argument i think there is a lag between the ground reality and where think tanks still are and i think we spent so much time with the narrative that put pakistan in the dock for so many years that it's not i think natural for people to snap out of it and realize that things have moved on and we are where we are now and in fact it's a net negative for the afghanistan peace process if we keep this lag going even from afghanistan quite frankly this conversation has changed completely but somehow i think this lag is there and i think the think tanks need to take it upon themselves uh to to push uh, and then take a cue from the private conversations of the us officials that i'm you know i know all of you have access to one way or another well thank you for that answer um i'm going to now uh open the floor to dr paul stanland he is the associate professor at university of chicago um and so uh i see that his camera's on so paul please go ahead hi thank you for this opportunity um so i'm going to be kind of blunt and i hope that's okay um i want to talk about well let me start with this um you and other pakistani officials have been discussing indian policy and human rights violations and you know i've been a critic of modi government on that front but i want to talk to you about or ask you about pakistan's record on human rights right so the same organizations that have critiqued indian policies like human rights watch have also been very critical of the pakistani government so human rights watch talks about the khan administration is increasing restrictions on media the opposition and ngos uh, amnesty talks about authorities intensifying their crackdown on the right to freedom of expression enforced disappearances remain pervasive freedom house very critical of the ability of individuals to practice express and express their religious beliefs in Pakistan. So what are specific, observable, measurable policies that Pakistan is or will undertake 
to kind of improve this. Otherwise, it feels like a lot of talking the talk without walking the walk. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this and what kind of outputs we should look for, like measurable outputs to see if these conditions have improved. So it's nice to see you. Thank you for this opportunity. My friend, you've got to be nicer to me after seeing me after so long. Um, look, uh, let me make two points. First of all, I have never accepted this comparison. Um, sorry, something. Oh, okay. Can you hear and see me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So first of all, Paul, I don't think it's a fair comparison. I mean, you're talking of apples and oranges. Why? What I am mentioning to you about the issue of Kashmir is actually an, a dispute that I want resolved. When I talk to you about Pakistan in a minute, that's exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to uh, IIOJK. So I don't think we're talking about what India is doing in India versus what Pakistan is doing in Pakistan. If you want to talk about that, talk to me about Delhi and talk to me about Chennai and talk to me about uh, the northeast of India and Kerala and whatever else there is. The issue of Kashmir is separate. And when I talk to you about the valley and Jammu and Ladakh, I'm talking to you about something that is as much mine as a conversation can be. So what India is doing in Delhi, I can talk to you about in the same vein as what I'll tell you about Pakistan, but not Kashmir. So I, I think this, this differentiation needs to be very clear. Uh, there are no UN resolutions uh, to resolve a dispute in Delhi or in Lahore. And there are no agreements that have been violated uh, on August 5th by Pakistan uh, on any territory. So I think we need to be absolutely clear that when Pakistan talks about this issue, there is an international law basis for it. And that's what we keep reminding the world to look at when they look at uh, IIOJK. I think that's a crucial difference that, that you must internalize. You can't just call it, oh, India is doing something in India. That's not the case for this territory. As far as Pakistan is concerned, so let me say two things. First of all, <clears throat> there are a million issues that Pakistan has to deal with, improve on, resolve, and do better on. No question about it. So, you know, if somebody is telling you or has told you, oh, well, Pakistan's perfect. I'm, you know, I'm not making that claim, nor will I ever do that. Pakistan, just like any other developing country, has to improve on many things. But the trajectory is polar opposite. Pakistan institutes a special minority commission. Pakistan has the highest rate of now dealing with issues of minority in courts, in litigation by the state clear directions, absolutely clear directions from the prime minister, public, private, that one of our key issues is interfaith harmony and gender empowerment. And in, a, in, in the coming days, you will also see formal structures come up like the Minority Commission specifically on these issues. And you will see Pakistan do this not only internally, but even externally and champion this cause. So there's no discrepancy there. In terms of the view that this is pervasive and that is pervasive, quite frankly, I think that was a bit of a broad brush. Um, and your next publisher won't accept the methodology that you just used to paint Pakistan with the brush you did. Problems? Absolutely. Are we dealing with them? Absolutely. Is Pakistan improving drastically in some things that you may point out? Absolutely. Has it done things? Absolutely. I think it's absolutely incorrect to say X has increased or whatever. If there is an issue that comes up and we've had issues in the past, some issues are religiously very sensitive for us. We've got to deal with them very carefully. But this is one side point. And the other side of this is that you are seeing a blatant, direct, Public insinuation of what? Minorities being undermined, using August 5th to 
trample the sensitivities of a large minority group. And to be very, very blunt, if you were to sit down and, and write down academically the definition of state sponsor of terrorism, if you leave India out of that, I, I don't know what the methodology is. What ultimately is a rogue state? Let, let me be sort of even more clear. UNSC resolutions on Kashmir thrown by the wayside. Shimla agreement, bilateral understanding that India used to have on violated by unilateral action, August 5th. Minority issues in front of you. We say dialogue in the pre 5th August environment, not possible. Uh, no response. So to me, you know, when we talk about this, I right now, I think any comparison between India and Pakistan is, is grossly unfair. As far as Pakistan being perfect, absolutely not. There, there are a number of things, we're working on it day and night. Is the trajectory, is the direction the right one? Absolutely. Is the negativity exaggerated? Yes, because one of our weakest points, quite frankly, is public diplomacy. Pakistan's never been good at it. I used to see this when I was in DC, and now that I'm in the system, I'm the first one to acknowledge, uh, we can't sell our story well, we need to work more on that. We thank Moe for your um, for your answer. I have a question here from the Q and A uh, section, and I wanted to shift the conversation a little bit, since, of course, with Pakistan, we're always shifting a little bit towards security. Um, but the question I have here is on behalf of Ambassador ha Haki Akil, who's the advisor um, to the chairman. Um, and do you th the question is, do you think that regional infrastructure projects, such as TAPI gas pipeline? or the TAP 500 can contribute to the stability and peace in the region? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I mean, I said one of the key elements of economic diplomacy is regional connectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is one of the pillars of where we want to go. The problem is this I in the TAPI, how do you get there? I mean, what are the terms for this? How do you move in that direction? That's not the only one. We have CASA 1000, which is an electricity grid. Same issue. IPI, of course, we know the objection wasn't only in India, but also in the US. Uh, but you know, sir, let me also say this. As somebody who spent so much time uh, working with all of you there, if you look at the last year and a half, US's own interests in the region, one by one, are being undermined and weakening. You know, one can say whatever one wants to say about the Iran-China deal and everything, but you've got to ask the question, why? Why is this happening? Why is a country like Nepal getting up? Why is Bangladesh getting up and saying what they're saying? Why is the India-China thing? So, you know, I think there's a deeper question here. Maybe it's not popular, but I, I honestly believe that regional connectivity is crucial, but there is a, there is a fundamental factor, actor, or variable that has to change, do things differently for the region to come together. Uh, if there's no effort made there, I honestly sense we're headed for an implosion within uh, that actor's territory. Well, thank you for that answer. Um, I'm going to switch over now to Dr. Chris Clary. He is the assistant professor at University, um, University at Albany. So Chris, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks, Moeen. So I take it, you know, I'm not in DC, uh, so I don't, I'm not maybe, I'm only like two or three years out of date rather than eight years out of date. Uh, but, you know, when I look at Pakistan from afar, uh, I see a country that is, is set to have a recession like much of the world this coming year, um, that probably is going through its biggest period of economic turmoil since the 1970s. But also I believe the government is allotting an increase for the defense budget of 12% for the coming fiscal year. So the economy is shrinking according to the most recent IMF forecast by maybe 1%. The, the defense budget's going up by 12%. And I get it. India has been India for the last 18 months in a way that's very vexatious. I thought you talked about very eloquently. But this is unsustainable. And so I don't, I'm curious how you think um pakistan can go forward because the defense budget can't take over the entire national budget um in order to keep up what you know pakistan understandably claims as a principled stand um on kashmir and elsewhere right how something's got to give 
or the Pakistani people will will suffer. And I think the danger is Pakistan could fall for a, the bait, if you will, and wind up in a similar place to the Soviet Union or some other country that tried to compete until no. it doesn't do it anymore. So, Chris, you know more than most as well as anybody, if you read my writings from, from the past, uh, one thing that's definitely not happening under my watch is the bait. Um, and quite frankly, the bait is out there. It's very deliberate. It's being done. It's being uh, sort of promoted. But look, first of all, on the budget, uh, the budget is uh, that wasn't in real terms. And second, keep in mind that Pakistan, so the expenditure on Corona, which because it was a civil military partnership, has come out of that pot uh, in large number, uh, in a large sort of sum. So it's a bit artificial this time, uh, and there's no way to disaggregate it in that way. But the jump is not nearly as high as it actually is because of what has happened, and and you know the 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 sum total is very high. As for every country, I mean, not only for us, but but that that um, that was used from from that end because that's where the um, uh, pot was for the institution, the military institution that was using it. But Chris, you are one of the best strategic thinkers in 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 uh, in the us tell me sitting in my position how can i advise my prime minister not to worry about the east you know i'm the last person to do this i mean you've known me for a long time but every single thing i look at quite frankly it will be treasonous for me nothing less to go to my prime minister and say actually we're just exaggerating this the sad part is chris none of it is exaggerated i mean I, I literally am seeing it every day authentically that what i'm telling you about the expansionist mindset what i'm telling you of i mean you people know better um, what is happening in in um, the uh, iiojk um, if i'm the one who can tell you that virtually every action that is taken it is not true that pakistan is not on the mind and it's a china issue look i'll be blunt with you i can point to incidents for you of terrorism in pakistan where there is no doubt on what was happening right so i i completely agree with you i mean i want all of the money to go to the economy i'm sitting here and telling you every pakistani does including the military but right now, my hands are so tied. Forget the, uh, the conversation about hard defense or whatever. I am telling you, you can hold me guilty for it. Because I'm the one advising on this issue and saying, I cannot, I cannot in good faith come and tell my, go and tell my prime minister, actually don't worry about it. Right? This is all for real. Then, perfectly fine. One can argue, oh, there are files, oh, that's, you know, China, that's here and there. But you know these things better than me. It flies both ways. And Balakot is very fresh, very raw, and very real in the Pakistani strategic mind. Right? So again, I mean, I, I take the spirit of your question. Pakistan is unable to meet compliance requirements for FATF. You talk about economic diplomacy, yet there are, uh, you know, sort of um, overnight legislation like the personal data protection bill, which harms U.S. companies. And I work with U.S. companies who, um, to be honest and be very frank with you, uh, 